Hello everybody and welcome to another player card review video for the Lord of the Rings LCG. My name is Ryan and today we are going to be casting our eye over the cards from the latest adventure pack, the Dungeons of Sirith Garat, which is the fifth pack from the Haradrim cycle. For this review I am joined by our regular adventure pack reviewer and fellow Lord of the Rings player, Liam. How are you doing Liam? How's everything in the UK? Yeah, not too bad. Um, cold and wet. I should imagine probably completely the opposite for you <laughs> now that you're in Australia. Yeah, it's nice and warm here, but it's very dark because it's currently three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I think the time differences are, are going to be an interesting issue that will come up <laughs> a few times in the future as well. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm well and, uh, and looking forward to looking through these cards. Good, me too. And uh, we are joined by a third commentator. His name is Joseph, aka B Gamer Joe. How is everything in Portland, Joseph? Plenty good. Just enjoying getting up so early on a Saturday morning. What time is it there? It's eight o'clock now. I think this just demonstrates dedication to the game, pure and simple. Nothing else would get me up at five a.m. on Saturday morning. The lure of the ring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an achievement to get all three of us online at the same time, though. And it's also an achievement for this pack to have finally come out because I looked at the last adventure pack review, the date of the recording, and it was July 24th, and it's now December the 10th. 40% of 2017 has gone by. <laughs> I think you'll find it's actually December 9th. Oh, yeah. GMT, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this uh, big announcement that we're expecting is happening yesterday for me. <laughs> It should actually happen whilst we're recording this, potentially. Yep, I've got the FFG Live Twitch feed open in a tab, so if it happens while we're reviewing a card, we'll just have to stop and tune in to find out what the big news is. 48 minutes. Not that you're counting. Just going to show how much we edit out <laughs> when it says 48 minutes time, but actually it's three minutes into the recording. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, another big piece of news is that we had a cycle announcement yesterday for me. Was it yesterday for you guys as well? Yes. Yeah, very, very cool announcement. And what is, what's even cooler is that uh, supposedly the announcement on the stream is not this. So the fact that we've got an announcement for a new expansion and a whole new cycle, anything that comes out on this stream that's positive is just going to be gravy. It's going to be even better. So the new expansion is Wilds of the Rovanian. Did you get a chance to do the review to get a chance to read the article? Yeah, I did immediately as it came out. What do you think of those okay. new cards that have been spoiled? They look really good to me. I like that necklace of Giriam looks amazing. Looks like it'll have some fun mechanics, change the game a good bit. Yeah, that guarded mechanic, I think, is really interesting. I hope it's something that they uh, use more often. It allows them to put pretty powerful cards at a low cost because uh, the guard, the fact that it will be guarded by an encounter card is uh, within itself quite a big negative. It's something you've got to deal with before you have access to the card. It's very clever. I really like it. It should be interesting how it interacts with different quests of different difficulty, but uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. We should see quite a few Dale cards as well, hopefully coming out. Because there's a, a Dale card in this pack too, so they're clearly setting it up. Right, it makes sense now. The uh, crossing of Poros um, sheet also indicates we're headed to Dale, and people are suspecting that, and they, it's now confirmed. Yeah, so that's the next pack, isn't it? Crossings of Poros. And uh, I've heard that somebody on this call has actually got that pack. I did manage to get my grubby paws on one. <laughs> That'll give you plenty of time to prepare for the next review video then. <laughs> yep. Playing the cards already. So what we usually do at the start of these videos is do a very brief recap of the last pack before we get into the current one. Uh, so the last one, if you cast your minds back way into the past, you may remember it was called the Black Serpent and there were some player cards in it. Uh, do you have any opinions about those cards now that you've had a chance to play with them? Yeah, so I've um, I've uh, had a chance to play with a couple of them and uh, witnessed a few being played as well. And I think it was... A reasonably solid pack, really. I think Fast Dread is as good as we thought. You know, a very good hero, but definitely needs a bit of work and to get it actually going. But strong. I liked. I, I liked watching you play Fast Dread. I thought he was. Uh, I thought he was interesting. I think he got better with the release of Aomer as well. Yeah, uh, you can use him with Dune here or Aomer now. Yeah, I played a Fast Dread Aomer deck uh, recently and pretty constricted as far as what you can put in it and how you can play it. But it is fun. I haven't seen him in many decks outside of those two, though. Right, I'm not sure how much how useful he is without either Dune here or Fast or Aomer. One card that uh, we thought looked really good 
was the Dunedain pipe, but having played with that, it feels to me still a bit like a, a bit of a mystery in terms of deck building. Because on the surface it looks really cool, but um, I made a deck with it and Joseph was testing that deck for me. And it's weird because you get one out, you kind of want to see it early, you want to see it quickly, so you want to include three copies. But you don't really want more than one in play. So it's really weird to think about how to build for that in terms of deck building. Yeah, I would just run one or two of them and then uh, hopefully you can bring along Ally Bilbo and just grab it when you want it. And I suppose because it makes you put the card onto the bottom of your deck from your hand first before you draw the card um, with its action, it kind of almost insinuates that your hand isn't that good. Yeah, I haven't found myself wanting more than one out. What about old Toby then? Because we made fun of that. Old Toby. <laughs> Um, yeah, I haven't played him. I don't know about you, uh, you guys, I haven't played him. I did play it once. It was okay. It's all right. It works well in the pipe deck. I haven't wanted to play it yet. Seems overcosted to me. But he's so happy. <laughs> of course he is. He's happy. I'm not happy. <laughs> Why aren't I'm, you happy? Because I don't want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan was mentioning um, that, that you had a pretty nice song deck as well, um, Joseph. So there was quite a few song cards in there. That, that, did you include many of the new ones? Yeah, I built up a couple different song decks since this dro pack dropped. Um, I built a couple different variations of a Hobbit deck or a Hobbit and Aragorn deck to play through Shadow of the Past. And it wasn't very good, but it was kind of fun. I got out Fireside Song and then use Song of Hope and a bunch of other different songs to boost Hobbit's willpower to really high levels. And it was it was fun, but it wasn't better than the standard Hobbit deck. The Song of Hope is nice since it's free, so Fireside Song is just another plus one, and you can control your willpower after that. So I think it's good, but not incredible. Did your group mate play a song deck for um, Mount Doom? I think he had Song of Hope out, but um, no other songs. Uh, I was just wondering, because uh, I still haven't had a chance to play that, but uh, I hear it's all about high willpower, not many characters. High willpower, high attack, high defense, and not very, very many characters. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> I did manage to uh, get a chance to play uh, Defender of Keir Andros and Rally the West in Mono Tactics deck um, with a splash of spirit. And um, I found myself not wanting to pay the three cost for Care of Andros because of the minus one uh, due to the hero lineup. Very often, like there was often better options in my hand. It felt a little bit redundant and my hero Theoden was defending anyway. But Rally to the West was a real surprise to me because when it did come out, it didn't happen super often because obviously with it being monotactics, you needed to get uh, the song out anyway to be able to play Rally to the West, uh, Rally the West, and also you have to then complete it and you want to see it quite early. But it did happen a couple of times, and when it did happen, I actually really, really liked it. It, it comboed nicely with the fact that all three heroes are questing, and it comboed nicely with the fact that the shield, Theoden's shield, it's got a nice little synergy there as well. So I definitely would keep, I think I'm keeping that in there for sure. Can't believe you want to prove me wrong about that card. I just I don't believe you would do that to me. <laughs> I played it a few times as well in the side quest deck, and I think it's pretty valuable too. Yeah, like you said in your, I'm assuming it's a Hiragon deck. Yes, yeah. It's it's big. Then your uh, your heroes can quest for what fourteen or fifteen right out the gate as soon as you get this finished. Yeah, and then as soon as the the mounts start going down, you start questing for even higher. And yeah, as I mentioned, the, the it's got nice synergy if, if Theoden gets tooled up with his mount and his shield, so he can quest pretty well, uh, ready, and then he's ready for a, one big defense with the shield, and he's got that extra quest point because of um, Rally the West as well. Right, he'd be sitting at five or six willpower, which means he'd be defending for seven or eight, right? Mm, it is only for one attack, but often, you know, if you've got any other ready in effects, he's you take the big guy like that and then the little chumps you can take again uh just without the the use of the shield but um a lot of setup but really powerful once it gets going yeah i think it's definitely worth playing i'm shaking my head i'm just now <laughs> you should like it i mean use this with a marth or not marthy um thurindir and it's plus two for him and it's fun it, was this in so solo by the way or multiplayer for me it was multiplayer i've played this solo grr <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I claimed it was multiplayer, mo you know, most applicable to multiplayer. But all right, I think that's probably a good example of a deck where it does work because all three heroes quest. Was there any other cards that would stand out for you guys? I know that um, Oath of Earol <laughs> was one that you perhaps had some comments on there, Ryan. It is good, yeah. but I feel like the value has gone down since they nerfed Hammer. Yeah, I agree. But I still haven't got to play it, but I did throw it into a Here Gone deck that I might be taking to the Fellowship event tomorrow. Or today in Australia. Right. <laughs> in 27 hours. Yeah, overall, I think we were, as usual, pretty positive about Black Serpent player cards. Yeah, I thought there was a nice smattering of uh, cards for a few different decks there. Especially the Monotactics decks got quite a bit of love there. Yeah, I threw Defender of Care Andros into my Monotactics deck, and I've really appreciated his both of his abilities. Except for when his text box gets blanked, then he's rubbish. <laughs> yeah, right. Paying all that for just those quite poor stats, really. It's bad. <laughs> Shall we move on and take a look at the cards from this pack now? Yeah, so the, uh, the new hero is a lore hero, and he is a hobbit called Falco Boffin. And he is seven threat. Uh, he's got two willpower, two attack, zero defense, and two hit points. Trait is obviously Hobbit, and Falco Boffin gets minus one threat cost for each Hobbit hero you control. And action, discard Falco Boffin to reduce your threat by seven, limit once per game. That is really weird. <laughs> I, read this, I read this card and I was a bit like, uh, a couple of things sprung to my mind. First was, who is Falco Boffin? I've been listening to the audiobooks for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and very recently, and I couldn't, could not remember where he comes from. Um, but uh, I don't know if you guys uh, are aware of him at all. Just barely, but I, I was, I've just been reading through it with my wife as well. And we did come across him, and I did a word search and found his name comes up three times. <laughs> I'm surprised they managed to get any flavor text in the card for him, to be honest. <laughs> the best quote seems to be, Falco, or Falco went home after lunch. <laughs> right, Class, classic hobby then. <laughs> um, but like digging into the card itself, so if you are running three hobbits, which I suspect you probably will want to do, he's coming in at four threat, which is incredibly cheap for a hero. I mean, that is low uh, for for t basically someone that's going to be giving you two quest and um, you know a resource each turn. Four is really cheap. And two attack. I mean, that's the highest attack of any hobbit at all, I think. If you're running three hobbits, he'll help you kill things off if you either fast hitch him, which you might not, because you might be sending him home for lunch anyway. <laughs> or just that early game where you need to kill stuff off, but you haven't got any big allies down yet, and you need a few attack. Might help. Hmm. So for me, um, his his low threat is is screaming secrecy. You're going to be wanting to have uh, you're going to be wanting him to perhaps put you into secrecy from the start. Exactly. I think he'll let you stay in secrecy for a good six, seven, eight turns rather than the two or three turns you might hope for in a standard deck. I was going to say a lot of the secrecy cards are lore as well. Out of the yeah. wild, risk some light. Needful to know. There's another one that keeps enemies from engaging too that might be worthwhile if you're going to stay in secrecy for a long time. Noiseless movement, the lore one. There's a good combo with Leaf Brooch. Yeah, exactly. I want to make a deck that has these three events, Courage Awaken, Noiseless Movement, Swift and Silent, and Leaf Brooch, and then you can play him for free and return him to your hand. I've almost pulled it off once. Leaf Brooch is one of those cards that you look at and always want to get working, but it's so difficult to do it. Falco might make it more usable. Yeah, definitely. His ability can keep you in secrecy for longer. One of the problems with that card is that once you go above 20 threat, it's doing nothing. Yeah, and you hate to have cards on the table doing nothing for three quarters of a game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and his, his action, though, is a very interesting one. It kind of reminds me a bit when Kaldara first came out, and I read the Kaldara card, and I thought, why would you ever want to discard your hero? You lose a resource each turn. You lose the stats for the card that you brought to the table. Um, and it just sort of really didn't sit right with me. But then, Kaldara has subsequently become an incredibly powerful deck. I mean, nerfed recently, but for a while it was really up there with the top decks. So 
I wonder if there's something clever that can be done with this. I mean, obviously, he's just reducing your threat. It's not like you're spamming a bunch of free, uh, of, of uh, expensive allies into play, but not sure. What, what are your thoughts on that? I got one clever thing you can do. Basically, if you're going to run a two hero deck, you might as well include Volko as well, because if you run him at the beginning of the game, he gives you one resource and you can use his action straight away once you spent the resource to basically have minus one threat compared to what you would have had because he's six threat cost, right? So he's taking you down by another one just by having him on the table. Right. I think he'll give two hero decks a huge boost. You'll have that willpower and resource at the beginning and you can discard it whenever you need to as soon as you get your strider card out and a couple of resourcefuls and then you got those extra um, resources you need and you had the early game boost and you still can remain a secrecy for several turns. I could see him working in a Hobbit song deck because if you don't have another lore hero but you're including Song of Wisdom and various song things, doesn't matter if he goes away because you should have a lore icon later on anyway. That's right, that's, that's smart. There is also the ability to bring heroes back from the graveyard as well. So you could, in theory, pair him up with a Spirit and discard him and then bring him back anyway. I mean, to be honest, he's not bringing like a super great deal to the table in terms of his stats, but it's bringing the resource generation back, which is the important part. Yeah, you can bring him back, attach Fall of Gilglad to him, kill him again. <laughs> Just take an undefended attack and then he'll go away and give you another minus seven. I think he's one of those cards that is very interesting, as you mentioned, from a deck building perspective. And the decks in which he will be put in will be clever decks. It will be tricksy decks. It will be decks that have interesting interactions and like unusual ways to play the game. And for that, I'm grateful. About his action, don't you find it quite thematic? Because as you said just now, he's a really minor character. He's not in the book for very long. So it really makes sense for him to leave play on turn one? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, I think he is really thematic. It's, it seems a little silly, but it, uh, thematic. And I think he'll make up a new deck work. It's nice to have a Hobbit hero that's lore, not Pippin. Uh, nothing against Pippin. He's one of my favorite heroes, but it's just nice to have other options. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, the artwork as well is... Uh... One of the more interesting drawings for a hero card. It almost looks like his head has been blown up like a balloon. Like, he's got no chin at all. I suppose he does have uh, zero defense and two hit points, so he's not going to be taking very much on the chin at all, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's currently holding the record for the longest neck in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And the widest neck. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about him before, and try. He reminds me of some sort of cartoon character I've seen before. He looks a bit like E.T. <laughs> I, th I thought when you said that you were referring to the Moomin. He looks like the little sort of like child in the Moomin. <laughs> That's an old school cartoon. <laughs> Any other thoughts on him before we move on? Just that this is the first time that I've been inspired to make a secrecy deck in a long time. I think. He'll make a secrecy deck much more viable, so I'm excited to stick him in and see what can actually happen. Yeah, I think anything that will um, help secrecy out, because when secrecy first was um, beginning to have cards for it, become an actual archetype, um, they are really strong, really powerful cards, but it's just so difficult to stay within secrecy for any you know significant number of turns and as a result the decks can be really hit and miss like if you if it all falls out nicely your, your deck draws well you, you can look at really powerful games but if it all goes backwards then you're in you're in big trouble yeah you need to see a few key cards early like your resourceful and your secrecy cards and if you don't see them like you said you get problems so he's going to help keep you in secrecy for longer the longer you can stay beneath 20 of that deck the better yeah it is, and unlocking those powerful secrecy cards comes at a massive cost, and that is basically lose, losing a hero. Worth noting that we actually have a lower card to bring a dead hero back now with the House of Healing, is that right? Ah. I haven't seen that card played yet. I only have a couple times, but with lore you could bring a, well, a couple healers, and then it would be fairly cheap to play. Yep, and you can play it with your good meal in your Hobbit deck as well, reduce it by another two. There you go. If you had two two healers out, good meal. You're only paying one to bring Falco back. Normally, you do run those healers in Hobbit decks as well, I think. Yeah, both 
the Warden of Healing and the Noldor healer would be uh, easy to run. Mm. Our next card is Knight of Dale, a leadership ally. Four cost, two willpower, two attack, one defense. Three hit points, Dale, and a warrior traits with two actions. First action is action, spend one leadership resource to ready Knight of Dale, limit once per round, and a valor action, ready Knight of Dale, limit once per round. So this uh, foreshadows our upcoming cycle. Yeah, I feel like he's a bit of a sleeper card because I don't really know what to make of him at this point because uh, he's quite expensive for what he brings to the table, 2-2-1, two, two, so he's not very specialized for a four-coster. But because we just had the next cycle announced, which is all about Dale, he might get better when we see what attachments he can get. Because at the moment, I think the only one that's probably worth putting on him is uh, Raiment of War, which is quite good for him, considering he can ready, so he can take advantage of both the defense and the attack and the hit points. But still, he's only defending for two and attacking for three. I don't like that one defense. Yeah, I think his stats are a bit wonky, to be honest. He's not very specialized. He's got very generic stats. And when you spend as much as four resources on a hero, you do want them to be reasonably specialized. And yes, he gets two bites at the cherry by being able to ready. But, um, you know, they're quite... In, without attachments, they're not going to be great. Do you know what I mean? Questing for two, maybe readying him and attacking for two. But, yeah, it's expensive. That's why I think we need to wait and see what happens with Dale. Because we really have no idea what a Dale deck looks like at the moment. So he so may he, get better. The Valor action is quite good. Yeah, the Valor action is very good. Because the other thing about, if, if you're not in Valor and you're actually just using his normal action, he costs four, so he's expensive. I mean, it is leadership, so you do have to take that into account. It's a, you know, a sphere that perhaps high-cost allies aren't such a big deal. But having to spend one resource uh, effectively every turn, if you want to take use, make use of that action every turn, it really drives his cost up even higher. He's quite good with a very good tail. Because uh, he's expensive, so you exhaust him to pay for it, but then you can actually ready him. Because one of the downsides sometimes with very, very good tail is that you end up with a lot of exhausted people. So you kind of have to squeak through a round. Whereas this guy, you can pay a resource to ready him, so you've got a body who's back up from that very good tail you just played. Yeah, any high-cost leadership allies with a ready option are really strong with a very good tail. That'd be a good good play. I don't really have very much more to say about him. But I'm sure we'll have uh, more options once we get more Dale cards. Yeah, I think I think the uh, Dale attachments um, and the ability to uh, ability to move the attachments around or get them back if allies are killed will make you want to put attachments on, on allies more often. Because at the moment, the only allies I'm ever putting attachments on are probably like Legolas, Boromir, super allies like that that are really worth having attachments on. But I think you're going to have more opportunity to really um, have uh, ally sweet with tons of attachments on the board and just making them really strong and i think that's what may make this card a lot stronger i saw a good joke about this guy i think it was from tales from the cards in a tweet he said that this guy was clean shaven when the last pack came out <laughs> he looks really angry he looks like he's trying to find the person who's responsible for the release schedule so they can give him a good <laughs> shakedown no it's shave sword. july august september november december <laughs> yeah, he looks he looks traumatized by the way, and that left hand is like, why did you do this to me? <laughs> Even his sword looks like it's begun to rust. <laughs> I was supposed to come out in the first quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have much else to say about this guy. One for the future, I reckon. Mm. I mean, at the moment, I'm I'm not unless there's cards that are going to be uh, really sort of making him more appealing to play. I, I can't see myself paying four and then paying one every round to ready him. I just think that that is very expensive, even in leadership. All right, the next card is Diligent Noble. It is a one-cost leadership attachment. It is a skill. Attached to a hero, limit one per hero. Attached hero gains the Noble trait. Response, after you play Diligent Noble from your hand, draw a card. I feel like I've seen this card before, but <laughs> in three different colors and with three different traits on it. Mm, I feel like there's a theme. So, and I still haven't used any of them. That's <laughs> so true. <laughs> do you think that this type of card, so we've now got the fourth and presumably final one, but do you think there's going to be 
any any other ones for it at all? Do you think there's they're going to sort of put any like another a four with four different traits, or do you think that's them done now? I'd like to see one given the Hobbit trait, which we discussed in the last video. Hairy toes. <laughs> oh, apparently the FFG stream has gone live. Should we take a moment and uh, see what it is, and then? Yeah. Uh... Well, it's probably more interesting than Diligent Noble. <laughs> Because the only interaction I can see with this card is the Captains of the West event, really. And that wasn't a card we were massively keen on, anyway. No. So I don't want to be down on the card or anything, because there's potential. Like, as soon as you start giving out traits to people, it opens up possibilities in the card pool. But... Yeah, as I said before, I appreciate these types of cards, but for me, they're just not going to... Unless it's a specific deck and a specific reason to do it, and it's kind of hard to find those reasons. It's a lot of setup. Hmm. All right, let's take a second to see what they're doing on this stream. Well, we just watched the live announcement about the big reveal, which it turned out to be a new app based on the LCG. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts about the announcement? Uh, looks interesting, but I, I could have been excited more by something else. Looks like it's a spin-off, really not a direct parallel at all. So, well, it looks interesting. It doesn't excite me very much. Yeah, I'll be honest. I um, it doesn't really feel like it uh, will necessarily have much to do with the actual living card game, the physical one, uh, in the sense that it looks like there's quite a different set of rules and quite different ways of playing it. One thing that I am glad that they said is that it's not random purchases within the app to get the cards, like opening packs, like uh, a collectible game or loot boxes or something like that, which I've really begun to absolutely detest in, in a lot of digital games that I play. So I like that, I appreciate that. I do not look forward to potentially rebuying a bunch of stuff that I do have physical, already have the physical cards for. It would be nice, but obviously very difficult uh, to implement, but it would be nice if there was like a code in the boxes or, you know, you got proof of purchase things in your packs that you could send away for codes to get the relevant cards, something like that. Obviously without knowing too much about how the app works. It would, would be nice not to repurchase everything again. What about you, Ryan? What are you, what are you feeling? It wasn't what I was expecting, I've got to say, although I don't really know what I was expecting. I felt like I'm not the right audience for it, weirdly, because I play the card game to get away from the computer as somebody who uses the computer a lot in my work life. And now, I, obviously, I do have a YouTube channel and I play on Octagon as well, which kind of just shows how obsessed I am with the game, really. Um, but I couldn't really see myself like immediately excited about it. like, oh, it's the same, but a little bit watered down. But then actually, when Caleb said at the end about the sneak attack thing, and I could see that there might be some things that would be really fun about that. And it would be mm. really cool to have random things happen that you can't do in the card game, and which probably wouldn't be very fun in the card game, like roll a dice and, you know, discard that many, yeah. many cards. And that's the ally who shows up. It means that sneak attack's not very reliable because you might get a one cost snowborn scout <laughs> or you might get like Gandalf. Played, it looked like they played with quite a lot of stats as well. Some of those heroes had a lot more health than the card game ones. I don't think there's even a defense stat at all, just hit points. Oh, really? That was my impression. And I do, um, yeah, I think, I think if it comes out on Android, I'll probably uh, give it a go and sort of see what it's like. Um, but um, I really, really hope this doesn't mean that the physical card game. Um, I hope it's good news for the physical card game in the sense that they'll want it still running alongside this so that almost like uh, new players may get into the app and then it will introduce them to the physical card game and they can perhaps sort of play that because the physical card game seems a lot more complex, a lot more complicated than a much more simplified version of it, which look like what the app would supply. I'm glad we did get a psycho announcement at least. Yeah, if you'd seen the app before the psycho announcement, you'd be thinking, uh-oh. Mm. Yeah, but he did say he was still working on the card game. And at this point, we seem to be one to two years behind in releases compared to what he's working on. So that bodes well for the future. I hope it brings in new players. I hope new people pick up the app, get into a nice streamlined, you know, almost on rails with regards to rules, uh, enjoy the game. And then as a result, want to pick up the physical game. Um, I really hope that that's the the line that they're that they're going for, rather than the uh, digital game replacing the physical game down the line. Could potentially go both ways. 
I don't know which. It could be that it brings new players in because they get exposed to it, or it could be it sucks lazy players away because it's easier to play. <laughs> That's true. That is true. It's a lot easier to fire up an app than it is to uh, build an encounter deck and a player deck and get all your tokens out and, and play the game. Much easier to play this one on an aeroplane as well. Mm. <laughs> which is yeah. nice. I did actually try to play Lord of the Rings on an airplane once on the little table you get on the chair. Didn't go well. <laughs> no turbulence issues, I hope. That was one problem. The other problem was that I didn't have any space to play any allies or any cards. <laughs> well, it looked like on that screen they had all their heroes and allies kind of all jumbled into the same line. Which is, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe they'll change yeah. that. Hopefully. I hope so. Re Real devotion to the game would uh, make you buy two seats so you have space <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> A ticket for your card game. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, it's in it's interesting news uh, for sure. Well, before that announcement, we were discussing the diligent noble card. Yeah, which I think we've probably said enough about. Really, you get the noble trait, cool. And you might play Captains of the West, which uh, I know is Joseph's favourite card from the Mountain of Firebox. <laughs> Still haven't played it. <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on to the next one? Yes, let's do that. Okay, the next card in the pack that we're going to have a look at is the Riddermark Knight. It's a tactics ally and it costs two to play. It's got zero willpower, two attack, zero defense, two hit points. He's Rohan and Warrior and his response reads, after Riddermark Knight is declared as an attacker, it gets plus two attack for this attack. At the end of this attack, discard Riddim uh, Riddermark Knight. So a uh, very Rohan feeling card here. What do you guys think? The cost is uh, obviously two, which is quite a lot for those stats, but um, you've got to bear in mind that it's very unlikely you'll be paying two for him if he's Rohan. Yeah, you could get him for one with a Theoden or zero with Theoden and here gone. He's awful similar to the Westfold Outrider. Same mm. stats, same cost with a different effect. I think he's a pretty strong card, especially for your early game. If you can play him, turn one or two for one resource and then go ahead and trigger him to kill off that first or second enemy that keeps you tied down in the beginning of the game. He might be pretty valuable. Good card with Guthwine as well, this guy, which is the sword that just came out in Mountain of Firebox. Right, if you play him for one, use him to attack for four, and then grab him back, you can recycle that as often as you need it. Yeah, that's very nice. And um, do you guys, when you play Rohan, um, sort of centric decks, do you um, do you often go tactics? Do you often go the tactics route? I always include tactics. I play the Hiragon deck a lot. It sounds like you play that one as well. Mm. So this would be a perfect fit in there. Yeah, but weapons and uh, shields and stuff are too good to pass up. Um, so I always run tactics in. Actually, almost always run tactics in my Rohan decks. Yeah, I think uh, the nice thing about Rohan is they've got uh, they've, they've got quite a large spectrum of decks that can be made. You can make sort of quite heavy questing decks using um, sort of all the Spirit Rohan cards, and then you can go uh, more aggressive and tact with tactics and leadership. Yeah, I feel like there's several different spheres now. You have the engagement or the stationary attack kind of decks with Vastred and Eomer. You have the whole sphere of decks around that you can build around Elfhelm with the mount boosts and then you have the Hiragon deck and then you have the mono spirit deck so many options at this point and he's just another option for you as well i i like him actually he's uh he's a he's a tidy card i like him i like that he's a response and not a forced effect because yes, that exactly. for sure what, what's that guy called escort from Medaras. he's forced he would be a lot more fun if it was uh, a response as well wouldn't he this yeah. guy you can control when you get that boost. And also, um, having played with Haradrim Spear from this cycle, which is the one-off plus three, that card's really good, especially for killing bosses and stuff. This is quite similar. Yeah, just throw him down for a quick four damage. Um, he also, uh, I really like that all of his stats are focused. You know, he's got two hit points, so he's not going to be um, too worried about those pesky um, one damage things that can come off the encounter deck. Yeah, I think I think he's a really solid card. I agree. Yep, I really like him. And he looks very gladiatorial somehow, that kind of helmet. The picture's awesome. I really like the picture. His 
yeah, he's uh, his horse is there's a lot going on in that picture. It's definitely it feels like it's a it's a really action packed still, doesn't it? Mm. Two knight cards in one pack, and they're both warriors and not knights. <laughs> is there a knight, knight trait? trait? Yeah, <laughs> there's an archer trait that has no development, but no knight. Yeah. There's loads of knights in Game of Thrones. It might be where I'm yeah, getting it from. Yeah, knight isn't really a Lord of the Rings term. It's kind of weird. No. Yeah, I think they just lump them all into warrior, don't they? Well, it's not even used in the books, I don't think, that specific term. No, that's true. Although a lot of the cards do have knight in their title, because you've got a couple of the um, Outlands cards of knight as well, don't they? Knights of the Swan and stuff. There's a couple, yeah. Yeah, I think he's a pretty straightforward card. There's quite a lot of straightforward cards in this pack. I think... Um, and he's one of them, and he does his he does his job and does it well. Yep, he is going to be thundering into some Rohan decks very soon. Shall we look at the next card? Let's do it. Our next card is Fierce Defense, a three cost tactics event, combat action, deal three damage to a non unique enemy engaged with you, and a Valor combat action, discard a non unique enemy engaged with you. Another Mumak answer. <laughs> what do you think about it, Liam? I think it's another straightforward card, to be honest, and I like it. Um, I, I like it uh, a lot. I think three cost in tactics is on the heavier side, like uh, not easy to play three cost events uh, consistently and, you know, not feel the, the hit. But for for what you get for it, yeah, three damage, three cost, that makes sense. And then if you are in Valor, it's just really good. This will be really nice for the... Against the shadow cycle, it seems you're into Valor a lot because the threat goes up so much. Some of those enemies are really tough. Mm. And um, I think it will work nicely in a direct damage deck as well. I do run this, uh, a direct damage deck quite often. Again, three cost will be hard to pay, but it's just this is this is the answer to those high hit point enemies. So you can chip them, chip them, chip them, chip them with all your events and you know, the different ways you can uh, sort of chip uh, enemies in a staging area. And then if he's, a, if he's a big boy, if he's got a big amount of health, then you can just smash him up with this. It is to be noted that it is non-unique though, so you're not going to be doing this to bosses, but um, those big, you know, heavy hitters that are smattered through a lot of encounter decks that are non-unique, uh, this, is, this is a really good answer to them. It is worth noting that it's also engaged with you. You can't do it around the table. Uh, that is a good point, actually. Limits it a little bit. Yeah. Would you? Uh, is this a card that you perhaps recur with Hammer, even with his only? Uh, now that he's only got three uh, reoccurrences. I don't think you need it more than three times. I wouldn't want to pay for it more than three times. I mean, there's only a few monster enemies in each uh, quest, so yeah, I think it'd be potentially worth it, depending on what you're playing. Mm. I like it. Uh, I think it's yeah, it's appropriately costed. I think it's a card that we'll see use for sure. I put a couple of copies of this into my into my Hergon deck that I'm bringing along with me to the event tomorrow. Um, there's one enemy in the attack on Dual Guldur that has 8 attack, 4 defense, 11 hit points. And it would be fun not to have to deal with that. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have much to do with defense to me. I, I said it's this to you before. Title. Yeah, I said this to you before, Joseph, but it seems less like fierce defense and more like tactical nuke, basically. Like, boom. <laughs> The best defense is a good offense, right? That's true. It's true. Should we move on to the next cards? Okay, next card is a Region Survivor. Uh, it costs two. He's a spirit ally. One willpower, one attack, one defense, three health. He's a Noldor. And his text is, while you have no cards in your hand, a Region Survivor gets plus one willpower, plus one attack, and plus one defense. So before we talk about the power level of the card... Um, he is probably the most vampiric card in the game. He's super gothic, and he looks like he's been surviving for a while. He needs yes. some red meat. What has he been surviving on? <laughs> the blood of uh, <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> wargs. There's wargs in a region at this point. Well, I think this guy could possibly be the best card in the pack. He's not flashy, but he's really strong. If you've yeah. got his, if you've got no cards in your hand, his stats are amazing for his cost. He's still decent for his one 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 cost. I mean, not amazing, but he'll stick around with three hit points. That's amazing for a spirit ally, really. And it, because he's Noldor, like the Noldor decks typically are the ones that 
draw a lot of cards and basically deck cycle often sit there with no cards in hand. So I feel like most of the time in that deck, he's 2-2-2-3, two, 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 which is absolutely insane for two resources. The same stats as the Wandering Ent at that point. Mm. And it doesn't come in exhausted. And it's a spirit. You do have to be conscious of the fact that you need your hand empty like as soon as the um, first phase is done. You don't want to be waiting around to the end of the um, round uh, to have an empty hand. To have this stat increase, you need to be aware of that. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to use cards for Noldor. But the fun thing is he's flexible, so if you have a card you want to discard later in the round, you can use him. You can not quest with him, and then you can use him for as an attacker if you discarded the card by combat phase, and if you have zero cards at the beginning, you can use him as a quester. Usually, when people talk about power creep in this game, I really disagree, because I really feel like the game got to a point where it started to grow wide rather than up, but this guy is probably the first card I've seen in a while where I really feel like he's edging out other allies. Like, I think if you're in a Noldor deck now and you're looking at him versus Sailor of Loon, you're probably going to go with this guy every time, unless there's direct damage stuff. He's really strong, but I don't think many people are actually going to play him outside of a devoted Noldor deck. I might be wrong, and it might be worth to play him, worth it to play him, but I doubt we'll see many people play him outside of that sphere. Yeah, maybe you're right. As well, you said that you tried him in your Noldor deck, and... When you're cycling Lords of the Eldar as well? Yeah, I was playing uh, the new quest, Kirith Gurat, last night, and I had three of him in my deck, and I got all three on the table. And yeah, with just one played, he becomes 3-3-3-3, three, 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 which is Scandal stats, basically. And at the end of the <laughs> game, I actually had the liberty to play two Lords of the Eldar, and then he became a 4-4-4-3 four, 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 ally, which, was, which at that point I didn't need the stats, really, because I had so many other allies on the table. And you mentioned the flexibility of that as well. The uh, stats are, are decent and they're across the board. Um, you could defend with him, you can quest with him, you can attack with him. Like it's uh, it's um, nice to have like that flexibility. It's good when allies are specialized, but allies like this, where you got a flat increase to all stats, it's nice that it's uh, it's um, you know a nice range of things that this ally can do. Yeah, two defense and three hit points is not bad for a uh, defender. Actually, he'll survive a, m a lot of enemies. Especially when he costs just two. I mean, like, what a bother. Yeah, if he does yeah. die, not a big deal, right? He's very good for two, that's for sure. I was surprised to see support for an Noldor deck because as I've played Noldor more and more, I feel like they're really strong. One of the strongest decks I've played in a while. Yeah, it's, f it's funny to hear Ryan say that he feels this is the uh, best card in the deck and it's uh, a Noldor card because... They are really good anyway. I don't see them getting played much, but at this point I'm addicted to my deck. Maybe best card in the pack was a bit strong, but I feel like in that deck he's really, really strong. Yeah, which I think is a good thing. Uh, there's no power cards that are just insane for every deck that you're going to put in all your decks, but there's good cards for several different decks in this pack. Yeah, I think that's a really fair comment about this pack. It's uh, It's got an array of, of strong cards for an array of different decks. And honestly, that seems to be the direction the game has been going. And people seem to be complaining about that cards aren't strong, aren't flashy, but I think they're strong and flashy in certain decks, but they aren't cards that you're going to play in everything, which I think is a healthy direction to go. Yeah, I agree. The more decks that are very powerful, let's say, or strong, the better. And the less cards that you have to play in every deck, the better. I was just looking at this guy's, uh, that thing he's wearing, I can't remember the name of it, doublet, his uh, gothic clothing. I wonder where he picked <laughs> that up from. He's very pretty. Backstreet in Camden, somewhere he got that from. <laughs> um, next one is Liam. So our next card is a spirit card, and it's Heirs of Erendil. <laughs> Heirs of Erendil. Spirit, cost one. Play only if you control a unique character with the Noldor trait and another unique character with the Duoden trait. Action. Choose a non-unique location in the staging area and raise your threat by X to discard it. X is the chosen location's printed quest points. So, nice little bit of uh, location control on this card um, in a sphere that loves to control uh, the locations in the staging area and, and generally trying to get through the locations. Um, I think this perhaps is 
one of my favorite cards in this pack. I think that this card is really strong. Increasing your threat is not a huge issue in Spirit. You've got multiple ways of reducing the threat. And you can get rid of some nasty, nasty stuff by just taking it um, on, on your threat dive instead. I agree. This is huge. Another point in its favor, you aren't exploring it, so no mm. exploration triggers will happen. You're just discarding it. No travel triggers, no exploration triggers. It's uh, getting rid of nasty things that happen when certain locations are sat in the staging area. Um, and I love it when I play a multiplayer game and you look across the table and someone's bought a location, a heavy location control deck because, boy, do you need it in multiplayer. And I think this is a really, really good tool for a deck that can use it. So the drawback mainly is Noldor and Duodin. So what, what sort of decks were you thinking you would put this type of uh, card in? For me, the first choice is Lore Aragorn for the Dunedain just because he's going to reset your threat anyway, so you're not going to be too worried about that cost of raising your threat all game, mm. or potentially three times, maybe, if you run this. Idrian is another good one. Idrian, I was thinking, would be really nice with this. But I don't know, off the top of my head, if she needs the location to be explored. Um, she do, uh, she does need the location to be explored, but it just gives you another tool. So like in your like you, it might be a location that you don't want to travel to or you don't want to explore, and she's still... You know, it still fits in with her theme, I think. I've been playing some Dune or Dying, Noldor combinations, and using Galadriel, and any version of Aragorn has been pretty fun. You can use her four willpower for the um, other event that targets those char- those traits and ready Aragorn. So, And she pr- um, provides the threat reduction, so I think that'd be a good fit. Yeah, strong card. Obviously, I, I quite like that they've put it where you were mentioning before, where uh, you know a card that you have to put in every deck. If this didn't have the Noldor and Duodenn trait, then it's in danger of being that type of card for Spirit. True. There's a lot of really, really nasty locations as well uh, that you just wouldn't want to travel to, but you want to get rid of quickly. Stuff like um, in Attack on Dol Guldur, there's a new forest battleground thing. Uh, I was looking at that right now too. Yeah, that's probably among the worst locations in the game. The amount of threat is based on the number of allies controlled by the person with the most allies, I think. Right. So usually and, when I've seen this, I've been playing a swarm deck and I it's like plus 10, 12 threat. And then when you explore it, it hits you hard too, doesn't it? Yeah, what do you get? One enemy per player when it's explored. Yeah, one enemy into the stationary per player. Yeah, somebody asked me uh, what type of deck they should take to the Fellowship event, and I said, I don't know because I'm not going to be playing it myself, but I would take something that can nuke that location. And this card is the card to do that. And another thing for this card that goes in its favor, its cost is one. (laughs) What? (laughs) One plus threat. Yeah, Yeah, one plus. That is very true, actually. That is part of the cost. That is true. But I mean, like, what the threat is just not a huge issue for Spirit. And one cost just to, like, get rid of them dirty locations. I love it. I'm really happy that it's increased your own threat rather than a doomed keyword or something. Oh, yeah. Good point. I don't know if you remember this location, Liam, but when we played Ruins of Belagos, there's something that exhausts your allies or makes them cost one more a location while it's in the staging area. Oh, uh, is that the one that we constantly miss the trigger on? I think it might be the cost one more. I remember it just being the most annoying location, though. It caused yeah. so many takebacks. <laughs> yeah. I'd much yeah. rather nuke that directly than do takebacks all night. Mm, oh, I definitely agree. I mean, um, so the cost to explore the location, that can sometimes be quite a lot. There's a couple of locations in the game that have really high exp- exploration values, like for actual amount that you need it is there a limit at which you feel like it, it probably wouldn't be worth it if is say five too much is, is six too much i've seen them go up to ten but i think you wouldn't be using this card on, on a location like that but is there a limit that you feel that you w- would really sort of wince at paying the threat for it i was going to bring that up actually because some of the really nasty ones are those high threat ones like gladden marshlands journey along the anduin nightmare 10 threat 10 progress and the other one I thought of as well is one from Dead Men's Dyke Nightmare, which is um, called Palace Ruins. Nine threat, nine progress. Really horrible. I don't think I'd want to pay ten and nine threat willy-nilly. You'd have, to, you'd have to be pretty desperate or very confident in reducing your threat or be sat at a pretty low threat value already. 
I'd be building around it, basically. I'd be running Laura Gorn, probably, and a low threat spirit deck with the aim of, like, once that location's there, I'm going to get rid of it. But then maybe in those cases, something like Strider's Path might be a better option to make it active quickly and just explore it that way. I think there probably is a limit on, like, I'm not sure you'd want to pay 30 threat in the course of a game. <laughs> you know, but, probably but, but maybe 15. Mm. You know, might be all couple right. Of, yeah, a couple of fives, a couple of like sixes. I think it just really depends on your deck you're playing and your game state. Because if you're yeah. sitting at 40 threat and you've got something you need to get rid of, it might not be a good choice. But if you're mm. running uh, some of the stronger threat reduction cards, I mean, it's just going to depend. But I think it's a great tool. I think it's, it's true. It kind of does m- sort of give it a couple more limitations in the sense that that's definitely something to consider as you're playing the card. You could also be really selfless. Like imagine you're about to lose, but if you can play this card, nuke a location, and the other three players win the game, they'll love you. <laughs> not not a card true. for me, then. <laughs> <laughs> just not selfless enough. I know. That's, yeah. <laughs> you could go, justice shall be done, and then play this. So there's a trade-off. If you, if you give me um, uh, Steward of Gondor turn one, I'll, I'll happily do it turn seven or eight. As soon as you said, if you give me, I knew you were going to say Steward of Gondor. <laughs> For a while, I was playing a spirit deck in my uh, Fellowships campaign, and I had all these good cards I could play, but I kept begging Steward off of people, and I made myself unpopular. <laughs> my favorite are in the multiplayer games where you know, just by looking at someone's hero lineup, they've got Steward in their deck. And you dig super hard for it. So I'll, I'll be turn. I'll be player one. That's no problem. I'll, I'll take the first turn. <laughs> <laughs> or you take six mulligans before they show up. <laughs> Who are you talking about? Who are we talking about? <laughs> Liam, in this case. <laughs> yeah, I, know, okay. I do love my mulligans. <laughs> I stretch the mulligan rule occasionally myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, going back to this card, I think this is uh, solid, super, super good, very good card. Really like it. This card is currently the most golden card in the game, and it has the largest swan's head in the game. <laughs> We're handing prizes out every which way today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling very generous tonight. What can I say? It's 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> tonight? This morning? Uh, I don't know what day it is. I don't know what hemisphere I'm in. <laughs> I, I don't know where I am. <laughs> do you know what the next card is, though? I do. But do do you have to go to work now, Joseph? I'm going to be late. That's okay. I'm just going for a couple more cards. (laughs) See, this is the kind of dedication we've got on this channel. We've got people staying up till 5 a.m. We've got people (laughs) bunking off of work. (laughs) Hey, I'm I'm, Uh, I'm missing out some Fortnite games, so got that going for me. (laughs) I'm just waiting for YouTube to send me my check for 50 cents, and this will all be worth it. (laughs) Notice I said my check. Your names were not involved. (laughs) Okay, uh, Leaflock. This is Joseph. Leaflock is a new Ent ally. We have a unique ally for three cost, zero willpower, two attack, two defense, three hit points. Ent trait cannot have restricted attachments. Enters play exhausted, usual for Ents. Leaflock gets plus one willpower for each damaged Ent you control with a limit of plus four. The art makes him worth it. Oh yeah, the art's amazing on it. That is one scary looking end. They have released the full a piece on their release article and it's even cooler in the, the full. I think I might have my new uh, phone wallpaper then, if that's the case. I gotta make myself a mat with this. Oh yeah. Now, I am a huge fan of Ents. I love, love playing Ents. It's, my, one of, it's gotta be probably my favourite deck to play. I love them. They're so strong. And it's nice to get another unique. I normally only ever run one unique for the Ents, uh, like one copy of each unique, uh, unless it's Quick Beam, because Quick Beam's just too good to not pass up on turn one. Um, I think this guy is a bit um, not the strongest Ent, I would say. His uh, stats don't necessarily work well with what he's getting buffed. Um, it goes along with the same trait of like one damage to all Ents, and you get a bunch of good things happening as a result of that but if you compare him to booming end which has a similar thing but for attack booming end starts at two or three attack already two. and two yeah and uh he doesn't have a limit on it and he can go 
just bonkers. Um, and he's not unique as well, so you can have like two, three permanents out, and then you're just not even worried about attacks after that. Having said that, I personally like the fact that it's got a limit. I think more cards need this limit on there. I think Boominent is a bit of a problem. I think that um, like Erebor Battlemaster is a bit of a problem, and the lack of limits there are what make parts of the game a bit redundant as a result. Um, so I am glad to see the limit, but I don't know, it's obviously not as strong as those types of cards. Yeah, I agree. They learn from their mistakes of not limiting things. It's more fun when you don't have a limit, but they do get crazy. But I, I feel like if he was unique, he can't go insane anyway. So I would have enjoyed seeing the limit higher, mostly because if you compare him to some of the other non-unique ants we have, he's not that impressive. The mm. the um, What's the other lore ant? Three cost. Um, Welling Hole Preserver. Yeah, Welling Hole Preserver, he's three cost, and he starts with three willpower, and I think two attack, and two defense, and three hit points. So for the same cost, you get willpower sooner, and only one less. So and you get all runs as well. one copy, but he's not impressive compared to the Preserver. Yeah, likewise. It's nice to have another copy of an M, but I can't see myself putting more than one in. He's also an M that you do not want to see early days. It takes a little a bit of time to get that damage built up on the Ents. Once it's there, it's easy to keep them stable because of the ready and healing effects that Welling Hall Preserver brings. But um, yeah, you don't want to see this guy early. This guy's like mid to late game, and then he's questing for four each turn. And unlike some of the other Ents, like Wandering Ent or Treebeard, say... He is useless outside of Ant deck as well. Yes. Any thoughts for, for yourself, Ryan? Basically the same as what you guys said. He's all right, but he's a one-of in an Ant deck, but you probably don't even need him, really. Yeah, I like that he's there. It's nice to see the uh, named Ants, and I just love them. I just think they're so cool. I, I just love the whole thing about just everything about them. is just so much fun. They are pretty straightforward to play, but that's why I like uh, running two Hobbits and Gandalf uh, in the end that I run, because Gandalf has enough tricks to keep the uh, gameplay interesting, and the events, uh, the Ents are just solid, and uh, it's also quite thematic, you know? Yeah, yeah, don't get me wrong, I, I like seeing them on the table, I have played them, but I mean, they just, he's, he's more of the same. Yeah, def I agree with that, for sure. And to be honest, like definitely not the strongest. Then he's not. The f if you if you're looking at your hand events and you can only play one or two this turn, uh, he's probably down the bottom of the queue, especially early game. It would be cool if he was two cast or like that. Mm. He's by far and away the scariest then, though. Love the art, absolutely love it. He goes in the deck just because of that. It looks like he's got a beard and everything. It's so cool. He doesn't look very sleepy. And almost tree-ish to me. <laughs> I know that was an odd quote to put on there, but I guess you can go from sleepy and tree-ish to this and pretty yeah. quickly. Leaflock is such a cool name. If you're going to be an ant, that's a cool name to have. It's another character who's really annoyed about the delay to this pack. He's so angry about it. It's like, <laughs> so next card is Legacy Blade. It is a lore attachment. Cost zero. Item. Weapon. Attached to a hero. Restricted. Attached hero gets plus one attack for each side quest in the victory display. Limit plus three attack. So anybody who's watched my channel knows that I like Thurindir and I like side quest decks. So this card I reckon is amazing. In, in my notes I've got written next to this card, wow. So Zero good. Zero cost. Zero cost. Are you serious? It's so good. I mean, it's no good until you actually complete a side quest. So you don't run yeah. this if you're not running any or you're not playing anything outside of the last two or three cycles but, but it's not even unique and if you are running a, a, a side quest deck you are going to have side quests in the victory display eventually and this is just gets so good exactly zero for one is good already yeah and it's restricted so you can have two of them on there plus six yeah and i like that it's given thurindia a second role now possibly because he might yeah, if you've done questing. three yeah if you've done three side quests he might quest for five ready somehow and then attack for five are you are you thinking you'd put this on Thurindir rather than another hero next to him? I think it'd go on anyone, to be honest. Um, it's, it it's is that... impressive that it doesn't have any restriction. It can go on any hero. Exactly. I think it could go on anybody. Like, if you can get Steed of the North onto Thurindir, and if you happen to engage an enemy, then you've got a five-attack hero to deal with it. Also, in multiplayer, I just like the idea of passing these out. So, yeah, have a, have a plus three, plus one, plus two for nothing. Also, you can dig for this with Master of the Forge, which is really awesome. And if it's early game, even if it's plus, if it 
you don't have any side quests, you can trigger Foe Hammer off it for free. Yep. Yep. Or if you're forced to discard something, you can discard this. If you're forced to discard an attachment. Yep. You just would always put it down, wouldn't you? There's, there's no reason not to. And I think with Dale coming into play, seeing some of the cards and Dale being around attachments, having an attachment that has no restrictions, yeah, it's playing off of a side qu- uh, of side quest mechanics, which perhaps Dale won't necessarily naturally tap into. But if you're pairing out of another deck, I think this could be really strong in Dale decks as well. Put three of them in there and uh, just pass them around and you know do whatever you want with them. Yeah, they seem to be about items, which this is. It's an item and a weapon. So good potential. <laughs> I don't run a ton of side quest decks, but I'm really looking forward to going back through the Angmar Awaken cycle and playing this just because you're constantly clearing side quests from the encounter deck. Yeah. And I need help in Angmar Awakens. <laughs> <Stuff. Yeah. laughs> nice to see that limit come into play as well. This could get pretty crazy. What is the highest number of side quests you've ever cleared in a quest? I want to say we've seen five in the victory display, Ryan. Is that, would that be fair? I think I've done six. I think I've had Thorinda at eight before. I think beneath the sands. Yeah, I think five is my record. But yeah, three is a good limit. It won't, won't limit it very often, but it's good to be there. Mm. And what a beautiful sword. We're all ready for this too, because it's been spoiled for an entire year. <laughs> I remember looking at this when it was spoiled and thinking, I can't wait to play with this card. And it worries me that that was a year ago. Mm-hmm. Where did life go? <laughs> where, where, what happened? <laughs> Hey, you're in Australia now. You're not even in the same country anymore. I know. I've managed to move across the world in the time it took for this card to come out. <laughs> come on, FFG. Sort it out. I have a house almost built that wasn't started before this card uh, came out. <laughs> <laughs> this card wins the award for the most things you can do in real life while waiting for it to come out. <laughs> <laughs> the copyright date is almost two years ago, 2016. Wow. 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 I will say one other thing about this card, right? And um, it's more about Thorindir, which is, this is a card that you run alongside him. And I feel like Thorindir, as an FFG-created hero, has had a lot of love compared to Nasir, another FFG-created hero from the last cycle. Because I was talking about uh, that hero with, uh, to Joseph the other day, and I said, I feel like they just basically forgot Nasir. She never got any toys. Whereas Thorindir, this is a toy for him. He's got a lot of love. Probably because they wanted to push side quests hard, because they knew people weren't really playing them. Yeah, they had to really, because as you say, they'd released a bunch of cards that were side quests that weren't getting played. So it made sense to have him become powerful because it enabled a lot more cards than uh, Nasia might. I think she may get some love in the next cycle because I've got I've got a sneaking suspicion that we're going to see a lot of items in that cycle, a lot of weapons, a lot of items, a lot of tools, attachments, things to put on characters and heroes. And I think she she would benefit greatly from some nice things there. I agree with what you're saying there, but I sometimes I think we overestimate how much designers respond to how people play. Because realistically, this probably was designed two years ago before we were even seeing very many side quests at all. So they'd have to look into their Palantir and anticipate how we're going to play, really. <laughs> Although it is them designing them, so they probably got ideas of what they want to come. I guess the playtesters would give them feedback. They build a process a lot earlier, too. Side quest came out in Angmar Awakened as well, and then there weren't many side quests, if I remember, in Dream Chaser. And yeah, then I don't we... think there were many at all. Yeah, and then it's kind of swung back the other way, where then now there's loads. I don't really remember people playing side quests all that much before this cycle really pushed them a bit more. Yeah, I think the support we've got has been about the right level, so they're definitely advantageous to play, but you don't have to. And they aren't rubbish. Oh yeah, I think the balance is is spot on. It's more just uh, I would like other heroes to get kind of similar love, maybe? Yeah, I agree. Okay, so the last card in this pack is a neutral one-cost event called Open the Armory. And its action is search the top 10 cards of your deck for a weapon or armor attachment and add it to your hand. Shuffle your deck. And the Valor action is search the top 5 cards of your deck for a weapon or armor attachment and put it into play. Shuffle your deck. Pretty good. There's a lot of different ways to look for weapons and attachments currently, and uh, this is among one of the better ways of doing it. Yeah, what do you think, Joseph? I like it a lot. I think it's a really good um, game to get your deck moving right out of the gate. It's neutral, which is huge. You can run it in any deck. I mean, Spirit and Leadership and Lore all have decent weapons now. 
So that's advantageous. I'm going to slot this into one of my decks with a bunch of uh, ranged characters for the event tomorrow to try to knock out some of those big enemies. So getting your weapons online fast is huge, and you can search 10, which is really nice as well. So I think it's I think it's big. I think this is awesome in Dune here and Fast Dread as well, going back to the previous pack, because um, that deck runs about nine weapons, if you include Raiment of War in that. And you really need to get weapons out quickly for that deck to work. So I really think this is worth including there. Would it replace any of the current weapon searching cards? So that's like Master, Ironsmith, and Bofa? Almost certainly. Yeah, it's got it, the cost is not anywhere near as prohibitive, although you don't get a body on the board. Yeah, he's uh, expensive as well. He costs three. Mm, he does. Um, but I he think... does have two willpower, so he's worth including in like a mono tactics deck if you really need that questing. True, as soon as you've got your weapons, you just start questing with him. I think as well, it's nice with Baragond, because you do have to consider that it does cost one to do it. So effectively, you're adding to the cost of the weapon, really. So um, Baragond then negates that again by reducing its cost by two. Yeah, he's such yeah. a good hero to see on the table in multiplayer. I haven't played with him for a while now, because I got a bit bored with him. Yeah, he's just always there, isn't he? He's solid. Just, yeah, never uh, sad to see him at a four-player table. I think when we played a lot last year, I think I brought him a lot. And yeah. turned him into a tower. Until in this cycle, there's a lot of shadow effects that say you can't ready till the end of the round. That really shuts down that kind of strategy. So do you think this card's going to whiff much? I mean, the Valor action's quite scary to use because you're only getting to look at five cards. I think you build around that. I think you, that's probably one of the challenges with this is figuring out how many copies of this to run and how many copies of your weapons to run. Probably, I don't know, I might be tempted to take out a weapon from the Dunhir deck and slot in two of these. Because when you do draw those weapons as the game progresses and you've already got two on him, they're basically dead cards. So you might want to fiddle mm -hmm. with it a bit, try and fiddle with the numbers and figure out what's right. And searching 10, as you guys have mentioned, is an awful large percentage of your deck. And in effect, this is somewhat like drawing a weapon. If you see this in your open hand, it's kind of like having the weapon in your open hand just costing one. Except it's even more flexible, and in some ways it's better than have drawing a weapon or armor card because you could potentially draw the one you need. Say mm. you're running Rohan and you need that shield, and you need Herogrim, and you can pick out whichever one you need at that moment. Yeah, it's true. So the only other way to search for armor that I can think of off the top of my head is Master Ironsmith. Right, which no one plays, right? No. <laughs> uh, I think Master of the Forge can dig for an attachment, but he's lore, and t most solid armor is tactics. Well, maybe with the Dale cycle coming out, you could make a whole deck devoted around putting out some of those really helpful and large weapon, item, armor attachments, spreading them around the board. You could have your supplier deck. Yeah, your yeah, your armory. It does feel like this pack has a definite good few nods towards this new cycle that's coming out. They usually do that. They usually put in like some clues. I remember there were a few Noldor cards in Angmar Awakened, I think. You always get something for the next cycle. That's quite nice. Then we look back and see, say, why didn't we? Why couldn't we tell where we were going? <laughs> <laughs> I think the valor action on this is a bit funny because uh, the ideal situation would be something like paying one and getting a free citadel plate. But I don't know if you're going to need it when you're above forty because you're probably already winning. Yeah, that's the thing with some of these valor actions. They're strong, but sometimes you don't need them. But sometimes you get to late game and that last effect on the last stage goes off and you are in trouble again so but yeah you can still use the regular action if you want to search the top 10 and be more consistent or if you're desperate you can use that top five i really like its potential early game that's what i think i'll be aiming at yeah really good for decks that need a weapon to get online faster than dune here aimer new purple aimer get that guth wine on him as quickly as possible hold your deck yeah legolas too he's gonna love this one what a good pack great isn't it I, this is a solid solid pack love it lots of as i've mentioned before just lots of smatterings of cards that will just really slot nicely into pre-existing decks and uh and just make them even more consistent and solid i like your observation that they're mostly quite straightforward in what they do mm. so, and and they work in a lot of different archetypes if i can use that word there's not many cards that you would actually play together in this pack no not at all um, and interestingly, like the actual player cards themselves, like the attachments, events, and um, allies are pretty straightforward, 
pretty much like slotting into pre-existing decks and and just making them better but the hero has the potential to uh, be a whole new beast within itself i think there's a there's a new thing there do you know what i mean right exactly Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the review. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening in, as always. And thank you very much, Liam and Joseph, for joining me in this review video. Any final thoughts about the pack or what might be coming in the next pack for those of us who own it already? I'm just excited to have new cards, finally. Excited to build some new decks. Excited to get smashed at the Fellowship event tomorrow. And I'm really pleased with the state of the game right now. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm really happy with this pack. I think it looks great and uh, really happy and excited with the Dale cycle as well. It's part of Middle Earth that I really like. So looking forward to exploring that some further. And um, yeah, thanks for having us on and um, looking forward to getting some physical cards onto the play table in the near future. Also really happy that the game is still alive. Three cheers <laughs> to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It would have been a bit disheartened if the big announcement was, uh, yeah, it's not continuing. <laughs> hype, hype, hype. I wish they had been a little more clear about it continuing in its normal state, but I think we have enough clues that we can be safe. Yeah, and I, th I think the uh, app will be uh, an interesting addition that will run parallel to this game and potentially bring in new players. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs>